Hello everyone. You can find goodies in the pinned comment. Immerse yourself in the world of erotic films with me. Don't hold back. Watch and listen to the whole video, there will be delicious moments. Succubus is a colorful and psychedelic film about a woman called Lorna, who is in a relationship with Jack Taylor, does some BDSM stage acting in a hip club, goes to swinging parties where little people and lesbians attend, and makes out with mannequins. She may also be involved in acts of violence and possibly murder? It's not entirely clear what's really going on, because a lot of what happens here is deliberately structureless slash dreamlike, and most of it could just be in Lorna's head. Succubus isn't really about the plot, though, it's more about soaking up the wonderful images that only Jess Franco can conjure up. Lorna Green, Janine Raynaud, is a dominatrix in a nightclub SNM show and the lover of the producer, William Francis Mulligan, Jack Taylor. Lorna attracts the attention of a stranger who believes she is the essence of evil and controls her mind. Lorna has sex with Mulligan and has a strange dream in which she stabs a man in the eye with a needle. The next morning she walks with Mulligan and sees a hearse on the road. When she looks at the body, she sees the man from her dream and cries. Soon Lorna has more daydreams, followed by murders, and she begins to mix reality with dreams. Soon she is confused with her nightmares and memories of a past life when she was a countess. Meanwhile, the stranger is plotting with Mulligan against Lorna. Necronomicon, a.k.a. Succubus, is Jess Franco's first film outside Spain due to censorship in his country. The film was financed by Germany and produced in West Germany. Considered a cult film by many viewers, I had high expectations, but I found it boring and with a messy script. My vote is 3. After making a few normal horror-slash-exploitation films, Franco indulged in this baffling but compelling fever dream of supernatural fantasy. Around this time, Franco, like his French counterpart Jean Rollin, began an artistic phase, weaving haunting scenes of surrealism, eroticism and horror into enigmatic, loosely constructed stories. Both directors were notorious for writing scripts a few hours before shooting or starting a film without a script based on a dream, relying on improvisation and inspiration to fill in the rest of the story. The difference is that while Roland would usually find a logical explanation for all the strange events along the way, Franco's work remains ambiguous. Our story begins with the beautiful redhead Lorna, Janine Reynaud, as a dominatrix in an avant-garde SNM nightclub act for jaded sophisticates. She is the symbol of dangerous seduction and obsession for men and women alike. Her Mephistophelian manager, Jack Taylor, has somehow transformed her into the essence of evil a devil on earth, but how and why is left unexplained. There are long, lyrical dream sequences, beautifully shot in soft, hazy tones, in which she keeps returning to a gothic castle by the sea. As she wanders through the elegant rooms, she has memories of a past life as a countess, her thoughts, like those of most of the characters, are narrated. In one very effective scene, a room full of mannequins in period dress becomes animated and menacing. As fantasy and reality merge, there are many strange encounters, tastefully restrained nude scenes, unusual for Franco, a couple of murders that may be hallucinations, and a decadent party straight out of La Dolce Vita. Indeed, Franco seems to be under the spell of Fellini, especially Juliet of the Spirits, for much of the film. As the story moves from Portugal to Berlin, there are some lovely scenes of the austere German city and creative shots, reflections in a car window, ducks on a pond, accompanied by poetic and philosophical musings. There is clearly some sort of artistic intent here, despite a flawed and confusing narrative. A plethora of random ideas and beautiful slash bizarre images pop up like wildflowers all over this crazy dreamscape, but offer no explanation. Like many David Lynch films, the story is a head-scratcher, but there is enough stylish and visually rewarding material to make it worth watching. This was an early color film for Franco, 
but he seems to have mastered the new process with relatively little difficulty. You're using a decidedly Bavesque palette. Succubus is seen as a transitional film for Franco, as from here on the emphasis on eroticism becomes much more pronounced, until at some point in the next decade it becomes almost pornographic. Again, because of its dreamlike nature, the film's narrative lapses and general incoherence are easier to accept than in, say, Eugenie D. Saad, 1970, where one does not really expect to find such liberties, although I am beginning to realize that with Franco virtually anything goes. Although he is not credited as the screenwriter, it is hard to imagine that Franco did not have a hand in the actual conception of the film, as the themes it explores are certainly in line with the rest of his work. Although the plot is not easy to follow, there are many references to well-known figures from the various arts, painting, literature, cinema, music that Franco seems to have been preoccupied with at the time. The film has some very striking images, not least the two SNM scenes, which were pretty much taboo at the time, with the soft focus and often sensual dream sequences being particular highlights. Another key scene finds Reynaud and Jack Taylor going up to her castle and he telling her the story of Faustine, a succubus. However, even in this abridged version of the film, there are still banal passages such as the drug-fueled fancy dress party sequence and other moments where the pace slows. The music, as usual in a Franco film, provides the perfect counterpoint to the onslaught of visual and narrative ideas. Special attention is also paid to the sound effects, which are intended to illustrate Janine Reynaud's disorientation. The casting of the main characters is also appropriate. Reynaud may not be one of Franco's prettiest leading ladies, but it is debatable whether anyone could have played the part with more conviction, and in any case her sensual body is used to the full throughout. Jack Taylor is commanding enough as her shady manager-slash-lover, Michelle Lemoyne is a mysterious and sinister Mephistophelian figure. Howard Vernon's brief appearance is natural and typically professional. This was an early color film for Franco, but he seems to have mastered the new process with relatively little problems, here utilizing a decidedly Bavesque palette. Succubus is considered a transitional film for Franco because, from here on in, the emphasis on eroticism will become much more pronounced until it almost turns into pornography sometime during the next decade. Here, too, because of its dreamlike nature, as was also to prove the case later with A Virgin Among the Living Dead, 1971, the film's narrative lapses and general incoherence are easier to accept than in, say, Eugenie D. Saad, 1970, where one does not really expect to find such liberties though I am beginning to realize that with Franco, virtually anything goes. Even though he does not receive credit for writing the screenplay, it is hard to imagine that Franco had no hand in its actual conception, as the themes the film explores are certainly in keeping with the rest of his oeuvre. While the plot is not easy to follow, it copiously references noted figures from the various arts, paintings, literature, cinema, music which apparently preoccupied Franco during this period. The film has some very striking imagery, not least of all, the two SNM scenes that were pretty much taboo at this point, with the soft focus and often sensual dream sequences being particular highlights. Another key scene finds Reynaud and Jack Taylor going up to her castle and he recounts the tale of Faustine, a succubus, to her. But, even in this shortened version of the film, one still has to contend with banal passages like the drugged costume party sequence and other moments where the pace drops. The music, as is customary for a Franco film, provides the perfect counterpoint to the onslaught of visual and narrative ideas. Special care is also taken with the sound effects which are meant to illustrate Janine Reynaud's disorientation. The casting of the main roles is appropriate as well. Reynaud may not rank among Franco's loveliest leading ladies, but it is arguable whether anyone could have essayed the part with more conviction and, in any case, her sensual body is certainly utilized to the hilt throughout. Jack Taylor is commanding enough as her shady manager-slash-lover, Michelle Lemoyne makes for a mysterious and sinister Mephistophelian figure. Howard Vernon's brief appearance is a natural, and typically professional. Jess Franco's Succubus his first of four films in 1967 alone, within a career over that, as of this date, 
contains around 190 pictures, takes a sharp turn from his previous films, many of which, such as The Awful Dr. Orloff, The Sadist Baron von Klaus, and Dr. Dr. Orloff's Monster, and especially The Diabolical Dr. Z, were perfectly clear, imaginatively filmed, beautifully photographed black and white mini masterpieces. Succubi is a film that is almost impossible to summarize, much less understand, even more so than Franco's 1988 film Venus in Fur. But Succubi is also a much weaker film and infinitely more boring and pretentious. The film appears to concern a nightclub performer named Lorna, who, it must be admitted, is played somewhat authoritatively by model Janine Reynaud who may or may not be an evil succubus sent from hell or perhaps simply a psychotic serial killer, or perhaps Lorna is just dreaming or fantasizing, really, it's hard to say for sure, and anyone who talks with great authority about this film is full of nonsense, as even Franco himself admits in a 22-minute interview that he doesn't understand his own movie. He excuses this by saying that Jean-Luc Goddard told him that a movie doesn't have to be understandable to be successful. Oy vey. Making matters worse, Reynaud herself is an unsympathetic and unattractive performer, although she's still kind of sexy. Among the various strange things that the film contains are some strange word association games, a pianist playing while looking at a math book, an LSD-induced party, some mild lesbianism between mannequins, and the fact that it seems to have been edited with an egg beater dot on the plus side, there is some dreamlike soft focus photography, beautiful scenery in Portugal and Berlin, as well as some strikingly beautiful images such as lovers seen through a fish tank. But what does it mean? The film was rated X in the US back in 1969, with X standing for excruciating, exhausting, or extremely hard to follow. Its trailer proclaimed the most unusual picture of the year, perhaps of years to come. In a film filled with so much ambiguity, the statement is decidedly true at least. That's the whole story for today. Watch it to the end, there's a lot more interesting there. Stay for the rehearsal. I've got an appointment. Be back in a few minutes. Go ahead. Lana's ready. All right. Untie me. 